once again, hello everyone, and thanks Diana and thanks to uh, the event organizers here for uh, yielding the floor to the event. So basically the question I'll be dealing with is the accommodation of the German power within the Europe and in the, in the international framework in the last few years, given the recent developments. I will start my presentation with the, with the two, uh, so I'll just briefly out, outline the, the, uh, the presentation, which consists of five, five elements. And uh, before we start with the introduction, uh, let me just uh, name, so outline two quotes. First one given by uh, Henry Kissinger that the German basic fault is that it's too big for Europe but too small for the world, which speaks enough about uh, the peculiar position of Germany and its economic and political power. And even more, the second one. Uh, outlined exactly four years ago uh, at, uh, at the peak of the European debt crisis by Alex Sikorsky, the former Polish uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, saying that uh, he, he is scared more about the German inactivity than the German activity and uh, basically being the first Polish Foreign Minister ever saying this. Okay, so introduction, why 2010, why 2015? As you all know, uh, we live in the, in, the, in, the, in the era of several crises in the EU, not only the fallout of the Arab, Arab Spring and the migration crisis that has been affecting every, every European country, but uh, this is only the last uh, the several set of crises that uh, has basically begun with the financial crisis. Simultaneously, we have the radical shift and the power transition uh, at the world scale, so the rising of the East, the, rise, the rising of the Asian economies, where uh, we have unprecedented uh, dynamics in terms of uh, demographic trends, uh, of course, spurred with the digital revolution uh, and uh, all these basically powers that are simply uh, uh, dynamizing the whole uh, the whole framework of the, of the global affairs. At the same time, we have and uh, we witness this uh, the U.S. disengagement, uh, named the war in Ukraine, named the uh, upheaval in the Middle East. Uh, the U.S. is definitely uh, losing in ways a global trajectory power, at least political will to enforce it. So basically this is uh, the area where Germany uh, is uh, stepping forward and where it needs to basically project and enlarge its economic and political power. Finally, within the last ten years, within, within the last five years, we have a uh, really successful uh, German um, economic uh, results, uh, the lowest uh, unemployment ever, the biggest rate surpluses, and uh, that of course then translates into political power. So the tipping point was basically the, Mink the security conference in, in February 2014 in München, where the entire German political leadership pledged for the more active role of Germany that uh, needs to project more power and basically that needs to do that needs to do more, that needs to do it earlier, and that needs to perform more decisive. The statement by President Gauck was repeated by the uh, Minister of Foreign Defense uh, Ursula von Leyen and the uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, Frank Walter Steinmeier. Uh, in the next, in the next uh, few minutes, I will just briefly outline the recent examples of uh, this German foreign policy engagement. Uh, we will start with a political crisis in Ukraine, uh, where that basically has, uh, in a way, signaled the change of the German uh, foreign policy and more active engagement in the nearby regions. Um, the picture you can see the German Minister of Foreign Affairs, Steinmeier, and uh, back then President uh, Yanukovych in 2014. Uh, Steinmeier was at, at the head of the EU, the EU basically, uh, mission back then in Kiev that supposed to do the power transition and set a scene for uh, uh, the new elections and uh, transitional government basically but just a few days after this agreement 
Uh, the Yanukovych was ousted and uh, basically <coughs> since then we have uh, a new constellation of political power in Ukraine, but uh, this affirmation and this role of Steinmeier and Germany was in a way maybe the first signal uh, and set of things to come in the next two years. Uh, very soon afterwards, so we both know the, uh, the annexation of Crimea in March 2014 and uh, the biggest political crisis in Europe in the, sec the post-Second World War era. Uh, that, in a way, again urged Germany to act more decisively and uh, to engage in managing uh, these transition and these ruptures in the international system. On the picture we can see um, Chancellor Merkel, surrounded with French President Hollande, uh, Belarusian President Lukashenko, and the leaders of Ukraine and Russia. Uh, the, uh, the picture was uh, shot in February 2015, and uh, basically it, it marked the uh, signing of the Minsk uh, Protocol, and the second stage, because the first one was ineffective. The goal of this protocol was uh, to cool down the tensions in Ukraine, to end the conflict, and uh, to open, to set the, uh, the path for the political transitions and general to de-escalate the conflict. A uh, famous Iranian nuclear deal after roughly more than 10 years of negotiations clinched uh, this April in Switzerland. Uh, it's important to say that Germany participated here as this number one, so this arrangement was set as part of the UN format. We had the five permanent <coughs> members of the Security Council and uh, Germany as the uh, additional member that has particular role and importance given its uh, economic uh, ties with uh, Iran and uh, given the fact that one large part of the U Iranian nuclear program was basically uh, enabled and uh, and uh, set up in a way upgraded with the German uh, economic and technical know-how. Uh, we all see and we all witness basically the lowering gold prices and the rift uh, in the Middle East and we can say now half a year after, more than eight months after this agreement that uh, in a way uh, Iranian uh, inclusion back into the international community has in a way really caused another tectonic shift in, the, in this part of, the, um, of Asia and world in general. Very famous picture, uh, beginning of August 2014, <clears throat> just a few days after the massive onslaught of Yazidis in North Iraq, uh, German Minister of Defense Ursula von Leyen in front of the German military aircraft. Uh, in August 2014, Germany decided to send weaponry uh, to Kurdish Peshmergas in order for them to fight the Islamic State in northern uh, Iraq. And uh, recently, so basically a few weeks ago, we had the largest, uh, the green light for the largest non-combat uh, German mission uh, that consisted of 1,200 personnel, six reconnaissance tornado jets, a uh, military ship that would uh, that needs basically to protect the French aircraft carrier and uh, the roof refueling aircraft. It's important to mention, of course, that this German decision was uh, immediate uh, consequence of the Paris terrorist attack and basically uh, of the of the desire of of France and Paris uh, for Germany to step up its end of wars and uh, to engage more vigorously in fight against the ISIS. Uh, the last slide regarding this thing, so uh, as of this January 2016, uh, the Germany has stepped up its efforts in fighting uh, Taliban and helping uh, the Afghan government uh, because the provisional, the provisional uh, goal of basically withdrawing from Afghanistan uh, has been cancelled so far. So from all these, uh, so from all these examples and the other activities that I didn't put on slides, such as in general supporting the NATO eastern flank through, uh, through uh, helping the NATO command in Chechen in Poland, uh, building up a rapid reaction force of the NATO that is able to react within two or three days, then the missions in Mali and, and uh, Central African Republic, 
where uh, in Germany uh, in investing its military hardware and uh, and uh, personnel within the different international fora. So on the next slide, some common elements of the engagement that you could see uh, at the previous slides is the Germany in the last five years, but in general, is a big, uh, in a way, big proponent of using the international network. You can see that the various arrangements that we've seen uh, are shaped within the different formats, either being the, within the auspices of the EU or the NATO, UN, or, or even the OSCE. With respect to international law, and I would especially uh, like to emphasize the importance of the Article 24.7 of the Lisbon Treaty, based on which basically Germany uh, stepped up its uh, efforts in fighting ISIS and helped uh, military, military support to France. Uh, there is this uh, famous defensive solidarity clause where it says that uh, Every member state being attacked has an obligation uh, basically to receive aid and assistance from other member states. And uh, I, I would, some people claim that uh, activation of this defensive clause and uh, uh, German support of, of France in this area is very, uh, very promising and it will in a way add, uh, add uh, real power to this clause. It's of course Germany when it acts, it, it acts through different to, to, through different networks and using the different partners. So it's not only France as the main strategic partner in Europe, but in general uh, using different fora such as Weimar Triangle, where it also acts to include the Poland. In general, we can say that Germany aims to empower different uh, international organizations and regional powers uh, and try tries to play more honest broker role and basically mobilize other resources. Last point, very important, so uh, the Germany has been a mostly to always likely to be quite reluctant in using the pure military force. All the examples you could see are examples of basically uh, other types of diplomatic engagements, either through in involving in peacekeeping forces, or military assistance, or building up other uh, other uh, forces that have actually boots on ground, uh, engagement in post-conflict reconstruction, international aid, trade, conflict resolution. So it definitely has, in a way, wider uh, wider perspective of using different tools, and uh, it, it's still pretty much a version of uh, risk averse when it comes to the to the usage of military power. The next point of my presentation is the German Foreign Policy Review undertaken uh, two years ago by the German Minister of Foreign Affairs. It's in a way a unique, uh, uh, it was a unique capacity building exercise of the uh, German Minister of Foreign Affairs that basically wanted to assess and to evaluate and give some new thoughts and reflections about the current development and the future, uh, future dynamics of German foreign policy. Uh, basically, it wanted to analyze the strategic tenets and uh, how to apply these new, uh, the new uh, ideas and uh, the, the new conclusions they have, they have touched upon. Some of the questions that guided this uh, review, so led by the German Minister of Foreign Affairs, is where should Germany direct its energy, where its interests lie, what, is, what are its responsibilities, what is the DNA of the German foreign policy and how it can make the difference. So basically, more or less, the whole debate was how, what is the task and how the Germany can engage in a globalized world and how it can make the most of its resources and uh, basically use some of the dynamics we are, witnesses, we are witnessing uh, uh, for its own benefits. Uh, the answer to the, this foreign policy review was the some 58 pages long uh, documents under the name Crisis Order Europe. So basically this is the answer that Germany aims um, uh, to deploy in times to come. Uh, there is an interesting saying by the Minister of Foreign Affairs, so crisis is not something exceptional, it's a new norm. And uh, Germany needs to increase its uh, 
uh, efforts it needs to uh, build up capacity, especially in, in terms of uh, conflict management. And of course, this doing through and within the European framework, as this is the only uh, perspective of strengthening international order and bringing legitimacy to its actions. Finally, the last slide, uh, so the new normal in general it has been quite contested topic in the German foreign policy debate, uh, given the, of course the history and given the peculiar position of Germany within the central, within the European continent. It has been dubbed as the re reluctant hegemon or benevolent hegemon that is basically reluctant to use its uh, capacity and uh, to use its foreign policy role. Uh, some of the some of the newest art authors claim that it's more geoeconomic power, and uh, while others claim it's a civilian power, basically uh, that can profit the most from um, the more orderly shaped and managed international order, that it lowers transaction costs, and that is basically uh, managing diffusion of ideas, money, capital, know-how, education, and everything that of course are the German, the German attributes. So roughly this is it. I hope I was quite brief and concise. Uh, thank you organizers and thank you for the cameraman.